Last week, Intel unveiled a pair of new processor families built on their latest generation fab process, Intel 18A. Intel Xeon Clearwater 4 server chips and Panther Lake mobile CPUs are both slated for release early next year, and I was given a sneak peek down in Phoenix a couple weeks ago. There's a lot to unpack from this announcement, both for these new CPUs, as well as the direction of Intel as a whole, and I'm going to do my best to explain it with LEGO. What am I drinking this morning? Coffee out of a Craft Computing insulated tumbler. Get yours at craftcomputing.store. And with that, welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. First off, a quick shout out to Intel for flying me out to Phoenix for the Intel Tech Tour 2025, where they gave journalists, analysts, and creators like me a first look at both Panther Lake and Clearwater Forest products, as well as a brief tour of their fabrication facility in Chandler, Arizona. That being said, Intel is not sponsoring this video or any coverage from the event. I am under no obligation to provide any coverage. Intel has no control over the content of this video, nor will they have the opportunity to see this video before it goes live on YouTube. When attending vendor events like this, you're often given some swag, sometimes in the form of a shirt or a small trinket. But this time around, we were given brick models of Intel's two new CPUs, one for Panther Lake mobile CPUs and another for Xeon Clearwater Forest. The biggest news from Intel's tech tour wasn't even about these new processors, at least not in my opinion, but rather about Intel's 18A process node. For years, we've heard Intel say that they're betting the company on Intel 7, and then Intel 3, and then Intel 20A, and now we're on Intel 18A. Intel 7 was their 10 nanometer process used for 12th gen Alder Lake and Sapphire Rapids 4th gen Xeon chips. Intel 4 saw Meteor Lake mobile chips, but not much else. Granite Rapids Xeons are the only CPUs that are actually built on Intel 3. And then Intel 20A was delayed so long it was eventually balled into Intel 18A and landed us where we are now. In short, Intel's process nodes have been either late to the party or completely underperforming by current standards ever since they failed to make the jump off of 14 nanometer back in 2016. Since that time, TSMC and Samsung have both eclipsed Internal's internal fab tech, along with counting Intel as a customer for desktop, mobile, and graphics products. Not the best look needing to send your CPU and graphics designs to your direct competitor to make because you can't build them yourself internally at the fab facility that you own. But now Intel is not only claiming that their 2 nanometer process, known as Intel 18A, is viable, but will be shipping in mass early next year, potentially beating TSMC and Samsung both to the market, if only by a couple of months. And I'm not saying that Intel is back on top by any means. We'll have to see how their chips perform, as well as yields that they're getting out of 18A. But for the first time in half a decade, Intel has an in-house fab process that seems to be competitive with the rest of the industry. For this video, I'm mostly going to be talking about Clearwater Force Xeon, although we will cover a couple aspects from Panther Lake mobile CPUs as well, mostly from a packaging and fabrication standpoint. Clearwater Forest is the second Intel chip to use only efficiency cores and is part of Intel's Xeon 6 Plus CPU lineup. Sierra Forest was the first generation e-core product and could be had with up to 288 Crestmont based efficiency cores. Clearwater Forest is sticking with that same formula, with CPUs available with up to 288 newer Darkmont based efficiency cores. In short, Intel is touting roughly a 17% increase in IPC versus the previous generation e-cores, along with doubling the L2 bandwidth, all within the same power and socket spec as the previous generation. That means in a two socket system, we're looking at up to 576 cores, 1,152 megabytes of cache, and a full 24 channels of DDR5-8000 memory support. In terms of density, this announcement does best AMD's Epic 9965, which tops out at 384 cores per two socket system. But do keep in mind that AMD still has simultaneous multi-threading, giving them 768 threads to work with, whereas the Clearwater Forest Xeon still has one thread per core. Epic 9965 also has the same 500 watt TDP as Intel and 12 channels of DDR5 ECC, but with a max speed of 6400 megatransfers per second. 
And of course, AMD has already hinted at their next generation Zen 6 based chips coming next year, which should up the ante to 256 cores and 512 threads per CPU, along with potentially exceeding Intel's memory bandwidth claims. Intel claims up to 1.3 terabytes per second at DDR5-8000, where AMD has previously claimed 1.6 terabytes per second. But again, we will likely need to wait until summer for both those chips to see the light of day and to be able to test them head to head. One thing is for sure, core density is getting absolutely insane no matter who's making chips these days. And whether you're a hyperscaler for virtualization or AI prefetching, it's nice to have options and competition in the market once again. While it's great to see Intel once again putting out meaningful products, and even better seeing them competitive with Foundry, it does have me questioning, why is Intel making their latest CPUs the way that they are? Let me be clear, I am not a CPU engineer. I don't even play one on TV, and the last holiday in Express I stayed at was about 10 years ago. But I do have a passing understanding of CPU architecture, signal integrity, layout, as well as my own two eyes to see how AMD and Apple are approaching CPU design right now. And I'm wondering if Intel is outthinking themselves. For those unfamiliar, with the release of Zen 2, AMD disaggregated their CPU design into what they call chiplets. Kind of like Lego, AMD only makes a couple small components that can be combined in multiple ways to build CPUs in multiple different combinations. For quite a few years, AMD essentially made only three components to cover every segment of the market, from budget desktops and laptops all the way up to two socket servers. They made a compute chiplet with eight cores and two different I.O. dies, one for desktop and one for server. Do you need a desktop CPU with between four and 16 cores? Cool, combine one or two CPU chiplets with a desktop I.O. die, and boom, you have a desktop Zen chip. Need a bigger CPU for Threadripper or Epic parts? Slap multiple compute chiplets together. Up to eight eight-core chiplets and an I.O. die can be combined for up to 64 cores. AMD has evolved that process a bit, and starting with Zen 4, AMD has both high-performance 8-core compute chiplets and high-efficiency chiplets with up to 16 cores each. Now with Zen 5, AMD has also started using their chiplet strategy in order to make larger-than-before APUs for products like Strix Halo. But these parts are still basically interchangeable, and very simple, relatively speaking when it comes to fabs, to put into place to create a CPU. Basically, you design an interface and wire routing on a PCB, solder your I.O. die and chiplets down into place, and boom, you have a CPU you can ship. By using only small chiplets, you increase your yields, allowing you to create higher quality and higher value parts. Manufacturing only a couple different parts means you don't have to pick and choose what your fab time is devoted to producing. By consolidating all of their parts down into just a couple of base components, a couple of different I.O. dies, a couple of different CPU chiplets, and maybe one or two different graphics APUs, you save a massive amount of time and complexity when it comes to manufacturing and design. Now, Intel has gone down a similar path by disaggregating their CPU components into what they call tiles. Gone are the days of single monolithic CPUs etched into silicon. Now Intel is making individual pieces and combining them into much more powerful chips. But unlike AMD, they kind of skipped the whole make the pieces interchangeable like Lego part of that equation. Rather than creating a CPU tile and an IO tile and then putting them onto a PCB and calling it a day, Intel has developed a 3D stacking technology called Foveros, where tiles are assembled and fused into a single package on top of an interposer die. Basically, they've disaggregated the individual CPU components into tiles, but then re-merged them into a monolithic assembly through advanced packaging. It still kind of works like Lego if you consider that you have to superglue each individual component in place and then still make the whole thing work. And it's not just the assembly method that has me all confused. It's also the design of the tiles themselves. See, AMD put all of their interconnect onto the PCB substrate. It's not the highest bandwidth way to do it, but it's definitely the simplest way to attach your CPU chiplets and IO dies together. Intel, meanwhile, is utilizing Foveros Direct 3D Assembly, which means that inside their fab, they're building each of these individual CPU tiles and other components on Intel 18A 2 nanometer. These are then placed onto a substrate base tile that's built on Intel 3, which also includes a clever bit of engineering called RibbonFET to pass both power and data through to the different layers of this final assembly. And unlike previous products from Intel, Clearwater's base tile also contains the L3 cache for the CPU rather than being a completely passive interconnect. 
On the far top and far bottom of the Clearwater Forest assembly are the I.O. tiles, which are responsible for things like memory controllers and PCIe connectivity. And those are built on a third process node based on Intel 7. They're also stacked so that their final height matches the final height of the CPU tiles as well as the base tile L3 cache interconnect. And then everything is placed on this one assembly and then finally soldered in place onto the final PCB and you have your finished 288 core module. Don't get me wrong, this is a seriously impressive bit of engineering and design work and I'm genuinely excited about Intel making such a dramatic turnaround. But the way Intel is dividing up their CPU, just to essentially glue it all back together, does leave me questioning if this is genuinely the direction they want to go, engineering and design-wise, or if this current CPU and the Panther Lake Mobile CPU are more engineering showcases designed to drum up external customers for their new 2 nanometer fabs. Let me explain, and to do that, let's take a look at Intel's Panther Lake mobile CPU, which was announced alongside Clearwater Forest at the beginning of the month. It's also built on Intel 18A and has disaggregated tile designs just like Clearwater Forest. There are five main components here. The compute tile, which contains four performance cores, eight efficiency cores, and four low power efficiency cores, CPU cache, NPU, and other various components. There's a GPU tile with up to 12 XE3 GPU cores, and an SOC or platform controller tile with things like PCI Express, USB, and other peripherals to tie everything together. But wait, I said five tiles and only accounted for three of them there. Well, there are the compute tiles, the system controller tile, and the GPU tile. But there's also two filler tiles to make the whole assembly square because the tiles are not universally sized. The reason they're not universally sized is because there are two different CPU tiles to choose from with either four performance and four LPE, or you can get a variant that also has the eight efficiency cores. There's two different GPU cores to choose from, one with 12 XE3 GPU cores and another with only four XE3 GPU cores. There's also two different system controller tiles with varying amounts of PCI Express connectivity, depending on which GPU tile you decide to put onto this thing. The two CPU tiles? are different sizes from each other. The two GPU tiles are different sizes from each other. The two system controller tiles are different sizes from each other. There's four different filler tiles depending on the combination that you put in here, and three total different base tiles that you would need to fit the three different sized assemblies. But wait, three different base tiles means three different CPU designs to get to the pinout on the bottom. So just in this one mobile CPU package or platform, you have three different configurations of CPU area layout, three different base tiles, three different PCBs, two different CPU packages, two different system controllers, two different GPUs, and four different filler tiles. That means that Panther Lake Mobile requires more varying tiles and design consideration than AMD's entire CPU product stack top to bottom. And Panther Lake is just one of Intel's current CPU product stacks. And Keep in mind, this still requires Foveros Direct 3D Assembly, which is a much more complex assembly process than AMD uses to make their entire product stack. All of Intel's current and next generation CPUs are built using tiles and are gonna have the same complexities and limitations built into them. Moving back to Clearwater Forest, we are a little bit more module with the 12 compute tiles and two I.O. tiles, but these are still assembled on different base tiles with Foveros Direct 3D manufacturing and placed on a 2.5D EMIB interposer layer on top of the PCB. AMD's current success came with shrinking the number of components they needed to make for CPUs to literally just three pieces, a compute chiplet and two different I.O. dies for your two different markets. Intel is likely seeing better yields by producing smaller chips now, but as I mentioned, Panther Lake alone has 12 individual components to manufacture at fab, along with putting them together in one of the most advanced packaging methods ever developed. Granite Rapids had three different compute dies and two different I.O. dies. Clearwater Forest might be using only a single compute tile model and a single active base tile, but multiple base PCBs and layouts depending on how the compute tiles will be installed. Remember, more varied models means more substrates to design, stock, manufacture, figure out your assembly process, all of this to create basically cut down versions of your max product, rather than just not installing a couple of the tiles and calling it a day. 
And again, to be fair, AMD does build more than a single chiplet these days. With Zen 5, Zen 5C, multiple I.O. dies for products across their entire stack, but they only make maybe 10 or fewer silicon parts for their entire CPU lineup right now. From four core desktop and mobile chips up to their 128 and 192 core Epic data center parts. Intel has developed more individual parts of silicon just for Panther Lake, just to produce the three different base models of the CPU that we're going to be receiving. So what does this all mean for the future of Intel? To be honest, it's hard to say at the moment. Speaking to a number of colleagues at the Intel Tech Tour in Phoenix, a lot of us noticed that Intel hasn't released an updated roadmap for any of their CPU markets, mobile, desktop, or server. Clearwater Forest and Panther Lake were the last CPUs on the roadmaps that were released in 2022. And I believe these parts aren't really indicative of what Intel plans on making long term. And again, I want to reiterate here that this is purely speculation on my part, but these two products in Panther Lake and Clearwater Forest did two things for Intel. One, they proved that Intel has a commercially scalable and viable two nanometer manufacturing process that beat TSMC and Samsung to the punch. And their foundry has the ability to develop and manufacture advanced 3D stacks and are currently looking for customers. Intel's current tile design, no! Intel's current tile design may indeed be the way that they want to move forward, but it also feels like there's no genuine benefit to Fovero's 3D manufacturing when you're comparing speeds and feeds between Intel's latest parts and the individual chiplets being designed by AMD and manufactured by TSMC. Intel could be building their CPUs in a much simpler manner and manufacturing far fewer components to increase yields. But instead, they're putting out products that prove that they have the ability to build some of the most advanced silicon products that have ever been produced. And I think that might be the bigger selling point for them right now. There's still a lot we don't know about these new products, and I'm not going to make any judgments on performance until I have actual parts in hand to run them through their paces, because the LEGO models, to be honest, just underperform a bit. But neither Panther Lake nor Clearwater Forest are due out until at least next year. So in the meantime, I get to speculate about whether or not Intel's tiles are the right choice for their CPU business when it comes to cost, manufacturing, and performance or if their entire design is simply to entice other companies like Apple, AMD, or Nvidia to start making their parts domestically. And that's an answer we won't get for quite some time. At least that's what I wrote last week. It turns out over the weekend, Microsoft announced that they indeed were taking Intel up on manufacturing and are going to be producing their new Maya 2 AI accelerators on Intel's 18A fab down in Chandler, Arizona. So, they were certainly impressed with what they saw. Now, I know this video might seem like I'm completely down on Intel or just an AMD shill or something like that. I'm actually quite excited to see these parts once they come out and to benchmark them against AMD. Intel has been down for a number of years and it's gonna take some pretty serious performance strides to get them back into real competitive shape. I am excited because competition breeds innovation and innovation breeds more competition. And competition means that we as consumers win. We get better parts for lower prices. I'm not a fan of any one company and I want all of them to do their best. This was simply me stating, I don't know if Intel's current roadmap is the one for their best success in the future, but I certainly hope it is. And with all of that said, that's gonna do for me in today's video. If you like this one, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you like hot takes like this and wanna help support me in what I do, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. First off, head on over to craftcomputing.store where we've got insulated coffee tumblers, rocks glasses, whiskey stones, everything you need to start drinking like a pro. Or head on over and subscribe to my Patreon. Link is down in the video description. And as a bonus, you'll get to join my exclusive Discord server where you can chat with me throughout the week. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone.